Live on WFLA Now, welcome to Climate Classroom. With a specialized degree in climate, he's pioneering the way we look at climate and extreme weather. Here's Chief Meteorologist and Climate Specialist Jeff Berardelli. All right, welcome everybody to this week's Climate Classroom. Now, the aim of this show is to educate our audience on all things climate and discuss the biggest climate topics of the moment. Now, this show streams live on WFLA.com and also WFLA's Facebook page. And then after the show airs, it is also available on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and also on Spotify. Now, today's main topic, what will climate change mean to this next generation, our children? A very important topic. And to discuss this with me, I want to welcome Cameron Hunt McNabb into the studio. Uh, she is a fourth generation Tampa Bay area native. Uh, she has a five year old daughter. She worries about the quality of life for her daughter, that quality of life that your daughter is going to have in the coming decades due to rising seas, rising heat. And we all know this, rising insurance premiums. It's getting harder to live here, that's for sure. Uh, Cameron, this is a topic that hits home for me as well. Of course, uh, as Cameron knows, I am a, a, a dad to an 18-month-old daughter who, once you become a parent, you really start to worry about these things a lot more than you did before. So welcome, Cameron, to the studio. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to our discussion. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to it as well. But before we do that... Let's go to climate headlines. You'll be back in 90 seconds, okay? <laughs> Number one, in a normal climate, record highs and record lows around the globe would be equal each year. But in a new analysis on 2022, Dr. Robert Rode of Berkeley Earth found in a stunning imbalance. Uh, daily record highs outpaced record lows by three to one around the globe. And then all-time record highs outpaced all-time record lows 9 to 1. Now, that is a clear sign that climate change's impact on extreme events is greater and that the climate is out of balance. Next. Seven Western states have reached a short-term deal through 2027. Uh, to help save the struggling Colorado River, which provides drinking water to over 40 million people. Arizona, California, and Nevada agreed to cut consumption by 13% each. Now, this is going to surprise you. 55% of Colorado River water is used to grow food for livestock. Grains for human consumption, that only makes up 13%. And residential water use only accounts for 12%. And last... We usually calculate the cost of climate change in dollars, but that says nothing about the human toll. In a study published on Monday, scientists looked at how global heating will change the human climate niche, areas where humans have a favorable climate to live and prosper. Right now, about 600 million people live outside of a suitable niche, but by 2030, it's likely to be about 2 billion. And by the end of the century, nearly 4 billion. Now, this is going to escalate hardship, famine, and also forced migration, especially in places like India, the Middle East, Africa, and Central America. Now, the authors stress there's a huge inequality here because the countries that suffer the most are the poorest and the ones that contributed least to climate change. All right, that is it for climate headlines. Now, I want to bring Cameron back in. So, Cameron, I want to start by uh, you telling me... Um, a little bit about yourself, about your history here in the Tampa Bay area, and what got you uh, concerned about climate change? Yes, absolutely. So my family's been here over 100 years. And I remember growing up, um, my grandmother and people in her generation would often say, it didn't used to be this hot. And uh, they would tell me about, um, you know, no AC in homes, no AC in the cars. And they would just, you know, sleep on the porch in the summer. And it was a little hot, but not bad. Um, and as a kid, I remembered being maybe a little skeptical of that, you know, like it's Florida, it's hot. Um, but turns out my grandmother and their generation was right. It didn't used to be this hot. So, <laughs> and, and we have plenty of data to support that as well. Yeah. But first I want to talk about the human element here, uh, being a new dad, you being, you being a mom, yeah. um, we're starting to feel the consequences already, but it is our children that are going to bear the burden of the inadvertent mistakes that we have made in the past. Of course, we didn't know that this was going to be the case 100 years ago when we built our whole system on fossil fuels, oil, gas, coal. And now, of course, over the past 50 years, we really started to realize, wow, these greenhouse gases are starting to warm the earth. 
Uh, now, we're probably not making changes quickly enough, but it's tough, right? There's 8 billion people. The whole yeah. infrastructure of, of, of our, our economy and, and the way that we function are built on fossil fuels. So we're certainly not responding very quickly. We could be doing a lot faster. Uh, but nevertheless, it is going to be up to our children to right this wrong. And that's a big burden to put on them. It absolutely is, yes. And I find myself, um, as a relatively new parent, you know, even thinking about not just, well, can I do something with my daughter that, you know, I did as a child, but will my daughter be able to do that with her daughter? You know, will I be able to do it with my granddaughter or what will what will Tampa look like, you know, in 50 years? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that has uh, impacted a lot of, uh, you know, the things that we're doing and um, the way that we're we're living our life. That you're teaching your daughter sustainability because mm -hmm. you want to be a part of the solution, right? Absolutely, yeah. yes. She helps me compost, and mm -hmm. we have a little vegetable garden that we grow, mm -hmm. and we've planted um, three or four trees on our property, um, including some fruit trees that we're waiting to get our first crop out of. So. You know, I, I always tell people the best thing you can do to help climate is to plant seeds, and I don't mean mm -hmm. literal seeds. You seem to be planting literal <laughs> seeds. I mean planting a seed, showing someone close to you, a family member, a friend, talking about climate change, and showing them, you know, a better way uh, of yeah. living. And that does rub off on, on, on your children rub off on their parents. Usually it's the opposite <laughs> way, right? We rub off on our friends. Mm -hmm. You know, the biggest predictor of whether or not someone will have solar panels in a neighborhood mm. is if someone else has solar panels. Mm. So we tend to follow each other as human beings. So I always say the best thing you could do is to plant seeds. But the truth really is, is that the little things we do, they help. It's good. Right. It pushes us in the right direction, but it's got to be systemic societal change or it's going to go nowhere. Our, our, uh, you know, our infrastructure, our corporations, our governments, if they don't make changes, then the little things we do. But it starts with us, right? It starts mm -hmm. grassroots. It starts with yeah. kind of forcing those changes. All right. Um, before we get into a deeper conversation here, I want to tell our viewers, mm -hmm. uh, I will gladly take your questions. Uh, we will gladly take your questions. So uh, please, uh, you can just put questions on, on our Facebook page. And JB, who's right behind the curtain over there, the wizard behind the curtain, uh, he's going to type your questions out and, uh, and we'll try to answer them on the air. All right. So with that said, um, let's talk about heat. You mm -hmm. asked, uh, is, it, is it truly getting warmer? And, right. and it, it is truly getting warmer. And JB, <laughs> we have a graphic on, on our weather system right now to show you the trend in temperatures over the past 50 or so years. And it depends upon the season. Mm -hmm. You can clearly see that that the warming is greatest during winter. We, we're warming about five, we've warmed five degrees Fahrenheit since 1970. So over 50 years, so it's about a degree mm -hmm. uh, per per decade mm -hmm. uh, during the winter time. During the summer, it's only been around two degrees. So the average is somewhere around three and a half degrees. That's how much we've warmed, which is slightly faster than the US uh, average. Now, the vast majority of that is, in fact, climate change, greenhouse warming. Mm -hmm. We're trapping, we're trapping the heat. You know those fossil fuels. We burn them. Greenhouse. You know all about this, uh, and, and it acts as a thicker and thicker and thicker blanket. But part of that is also uh, urban heating. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a lot more buildings that traps more heat. Uh, our thermometer is located at the airport, which is kind of a very warm place. So there's a little bit of additional heat added onto that as well. But your grandparents are correct. Uh, <laughs> it has, in fact, been warming over over all those years. Um, and I have some other graphics to show you as well, but um, have you ever heard scientists say that when the averages warm a little bit, the extremes warm a lot? Mm, no, I hadn't heard that. Well, we were just talking in, in one of the climate headlines about how uh, record highs are outpacing record lows around the world about three to one, mm -hmm. but all time record highs, so the highest it's ever been in any one city, those are outpacing the all time record lows by nine to one. So mm -hmm. the extremes are being accentuated even more than kind of the middle of the ground. So mm. those 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 slower uh, those those small changes can can mean some really big impacts. So I want to go uh, to the next graphic here. This really illustrates it. You can mm. see the difference between record highs and record lows in the Tampa Bay area, and we basically yeah. have no record lows left. Mm -hmm. There's just none left. Maybe once in a while we'll get one. Uh, and we have all record highs acro across our area. And that's another sure sign, not just the gradual temperature change, but the change in record highs and record lows. Yeah, I um, was just also reading about the um, recent report that came out, I think, from the city about our urban canopy and how that has really decreased in the last, I think, five years, um, uh, especially like in South Tampa, they lost um, like 6%. And so I know that is also probably contributing right to the heat um, and, and 
carbon capture, yeah. And, and, and you probably have heard all about how there's an inequality there. Yeah. Oftentimes, it's the urban areas. You have um, uh, people that are a little uh, less advantaged. Um, mm -hmm. And in, in that particular case, we see much greater heating in urban areas, mm -hmm. uh, especially in the inner city where there are not nearly as many trees. It's a lot. It's, it's not just a couple of degrees. It can right. be as much as 10 degrees during a, a hot summer day. Think about the difference between 95 and 105 degrees. Yeah. Pavement heats up. So there's an inequality there that, uh, that uh, you know, a lot of climate people are very focused on as well. Yeah. I want to show you this graphic. This is really interesting. So we basically call these danger days where the heat index in Tampa goes above 105 degrees. That's the, <laughs> the kind of the measuring stick that we use. Now, you can see back in 1985, we used to average about 14 days per year mm -hmm. where uh, the heat index was over 105. Now we average somewhere about a month and a half. A month mm -hmm. and a half, we have heat indices that will, at one point during the afternoon, get to around 105 degrees. Now let's fast forward to 2050. We're expecting 80 days in Tampa mm -hmm. where we have these danger days, days where the heat index is over 105. Then fast forward to 2080. And think about it. Our, my, my child, my, my little girl... She's, you know, going to be, you know, uh, how old? Uh, you could do the math for me. She's going to be 60 years old or so uh, yeah. during the time, right? So when she's 60, uh, and really not even, uh, she'll have to go with, through 100, 100 days uh, per summer where, uh, where and, and also not just summer, but also the end of, end of spring and, and the start of fall as well, yeah. where she's going to have to deal with these danger days. So mm -hmm. is, this, is this a, this kind of, uh, you know, climate, is that something you, you think that, children or people in the future are going to want to be in? Right. I don't. I was even on the drive over here just remembering that I would start elementary school, you know, around September and we'd just have recess for an hour or whatever each day. No shade in sight, you know, and I won't let my daughter do that now. You know, she can't go out in the middle of September for an hour <laughs> with no shade. Um, and so, yeah, I think that I worry about maybe, you know, how inhabitable or um, how, you know, will my daughter want to put up with that, right, kind of climate yeah. um, in the future? And, you know, also, of course, we're dealing with other stuff, too, like rising insurance premiums. Yeah. I mean, I think anybody watching this right now <laughs> that's watching from anywhere in the state of Florida, mm -hmm. that is a major concern for everybody because it seems like every single year we're seeing not just mm -hmm. small increases in insurance, yeah. but big Mm -hmm. increases. My dad called me a couple of months ago to say that they doubled his insurance. Now, these are people on fixed incomes. Right. You know, my mom, they raised her insurance by over 50 percent. She was forced to put a new roof, roof on and, and she was able to get that premium back down again. But I mean, it seems completely unsustainable for anyone that is not rich. Let's be honest. Yeah. And a lot of the people, you know, even like my family who maybe have been here for a long time and have been able to afford it in the past now can't, you know, and yeah. they can't. Mine only went up 10 percent, which was outrageous, but also on the low end, I think, of what, sure. you know, everyone else's went up. Um, so, yeah, I worry also about, you know, will my daughter be able to afford to live here? Mm. Um, and it's not even about like purchasing a house or land. It's about right the flood insurance or just the insurance in general. There's a lot of things that are going to become more complicated. You know, to be honest with you, and I know there are people watching at home too, um, you know, probably thinking this, it's not just climate change. There are a lot of things that are becoming more complicated in the world. Mm -hmm. So when we think about our children, are we worried about political instability? Are we worried about, you know, inflation? Are we worried about, you know, worse hurricane sea level rise? Mm -hmm. You know what? Climate change compounds all of that. Mm -hmm. I don't think that people realize or think about it very much. You know, the migration crisis that we have at the border, I always tell people, and I said this five years ago, I said, do you think there's a crisis now? You just wait until no one can live in Central America anymore. Mm -hmm. Because Honduras, about 85% of their economy is built on agriculture. Mm -hmm. So back a couple of years ago, we had two storms. Uh, they were uh, the Iota, Iota storm and the Ada storm. So that was that, that, that year where we had, you know, 30 hurricanes. Mm -hmm. And these happened very late in the season, and there was a tremendous amount of extra heat left over in the Caribbean. Those hurricanes would have happened anyway, but climate change undoubtedly added more heat than it would have otherwise been there for these storms. They came on shore as major hurricanes, and a one-two punch in a 15-mile area, by the way, mm -hmm. and, and the end result of that, 600,000 people were displaced from their homes. 600,000 people. Um, and the problem with that, obviously, and we saw that coming, as soon as that happened, I said, oh, we're going to have a lot of people at our border soon. The issue with that is, is first of all, it's a humanitarian issue. We're, these are people. Mm -hmm. you know, They have major needs. They're just trying to put food on the table. Right. They don't have a place to work anymore. They don't have a place to live anymore. So this is a major problem. But then beyond that, it creates political instability in our nation. So now it's not just a question of is there less food? 
because there's the one food producing reasons not producing food anymore. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, or but it's political instability. It, it it's a it's it's a it's they call it a compounder. Climate change mm-hmm. compounds other issues around the world. So that's how. That's what worries me most when it comes to climate change. Can yeah. we deal with that hurricane? Sure, we'll pick ourselves back up. Can we deal with that heat wave? Sure, the heat wave will pass in three weeks or so. Right. It is how it compounds all the other things in the world that raise prices, that cause political instability. Would you? Is that stuff that you've thought about as well? Um, only a little bit. And in fact, you know, I, I really appreciated you bringing that up because I find myself, especially around hurricanes, and you know, as a Floridian, I've been through quite a few of them, but I tend to sometimes just focus on the immediate part of it, like, okay, where is it gonna land? And, you know, do I know anyone down there? And, you know, did anyone die? Like that. But I then find that at least myself, and maybe, you know, our news media or whatever, we often kind of move along um, from it after mm-hmm. the immediate yep, part. Yep. And then, you know, I'm left thinking like, well, what are the long term, right? More con- consequences of a hurricane or just a kind of natural disaster? Or how does how might we be feeling these impacts, you know, months later or even a year later? You may, you bring up such a good point. Um, you know, uh, basically, I tell people getting through the hurricane sometimes is the easy part. Yeah. Getting through... The recovery process, boy, that takes years. I mean, think about the amount of contractors needed to put Southwest Florida back together again. Right. So, and, and believe me, you and me, we're not getting the contractors. It's the really <laughs> rich people that are. Yeah. And so, again, inequality, tremendous inequality when it comes to climate change. Mm-hmm. It's always the poor that, uh, that bear the biggest burden. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's move on to the next thing that you mentioned, which is sea level rise. So <laughs> what was you, you were saying that it's kind of complicated, right? You're not sure what to believe. Yeah, I... I will find myself, you know, maybe Googling or trying to, um, or even just coming across like a graphic or a map and, and it'll say things like, you know, this is what it'll look like in 2050. Mm -hmm. And this is what, you know, it'll look like in 2080. Mm -hmm. But often I would find that like each map is different and somebody would say, you know, one foot, somebody would say three feet. And so kind of sifting through a lot of that information, I found, you know, kind of difficult to do. Um, and so I, like, I'm reading it and I'm, I'm thinking about it, but I'm also like, maybe sometimes I don't feel, um, fully equipped to Mm -hmm. figure out, right. What is kind of a realistic assessment versus what's alarmist or, you know, extreme. And I think that scientists themselves, um, are still trying to figure out what's going to happen here. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they are without a doubt. I mean, ice sheet (laughs) instability. So essentially what happens on Greenland and Antarctica, it's extraordinarily hard to predict. And Mm -hmm. one of the problems is we don't know exactly when the tipping points that we are crossing or have already crossed are going to really materialize into a tremendous amount of ice that falls into the ocean. Um, Now, we know uh, with pretty good certainty that we're going to see a very specific amount of sea level rise over the 30 years, next 30 years. We're not expecting a catastrophic collapse in Antarctica or in Greenland over the next 30 years from the experts that I've talked to. So with that said, the prediction from NOAA is about 14 inches worth of sea level rise in Tampa Bay in about 30 years. So in 30 years, we'll have another 14 inches. So what does that mean? Well, it means that most of Tampa Bay will still be in Tampa Bay. It won't be (laughs) spilling over into our streets. But 14 inches means that days, a lot of days when the high tide is so high and the winds are a little stronger. Mm -hmm. So we're going to get a lot more overspill. Mm -hmm. We're going to get a lot more days where there's nuisance water on Bayshore Boulevard and Shore Acres. Shore Acres always Mm -hmm. floods and, you know, and other places uh, along our coast that that typically flood. Mm -hmm. So, and of course, remember, you know, there's a couple things going on here. Insurance policies are are taking all that into account and even mortgages are too, Mm -hmm. right? So, you know, as sea level continues to accelerate and it is accelerating, um, Right now, a 30-year mortgage may be safe. 30 years from now, a 30-year mortgage may not be safe anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, so are you? do you know kind of the makeup of, of, of sea level rise in terms of what is causing the oceans to rise? Because it's a little more complicated than just melting ice. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I think I've mostly heard or thought about melting ice. Right. Know? And of course, that's, that's ice on land, not ice that's already kind of floating in the water because that's already, uh, uh, you know, compensated for. Um, so about half of the sea level rise we've seen to date, and it's probably about in, in our area, it's probably about 10, 12 inches or so. Mm-hmm. Um, that is due to the expansion of the water column due to heating. We know heat expands, right? Mm-hmm. So that's what's happening. You put more warmth into the oceans. Oceans have warmed by around two degrees Fahrenheit. You get 
kind of higher higher water. Mm. And the other half is due to, and it's, it's a, there's a little bit more too. There's not just that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but let's say the other half is due to melting ice. And actually some of it is due to a slowing down of an ocean current in the Atlantic Ocean, mm. uh, which essentially is an extension of the Gulf Stream. Mm -hmm. So it's complicated. But without a doubt, going forward over the next few decades, uh, the, the greater percentage of, of rise is going to come from melting ice. And that's mm -hmm. especially going to be true of Greenland and Antarctica as well. So, JB, I have a graphic on our weather computer I want to bring up, and I want to show you what Tampa Bay is going to look like now, what it looks like basically now. So it's the current shoreline, and so nothing has changed. This is what <laughs> Tampa, this is the Tampa that you're, you know, for the most part, that your mm -hmm. grandmother knew, that, you know, four <laughs> generations back was, there's been a little bit of rise, but it hasn't affected our coastlines yet. Mm -hmm. All right, now let's look at three feet of sea level rise. So look at McDale Air Force Base. Uh, much of that is now underwater. Mm -hmm. Look at Shore Acres. Uh, probably down to about Coffee Bot Bayou. That's mm -hmm. all underwater. And but and have you been to Coffee Bot Bayou? I have. Yes. Oh, <laughs> my favorite place in the world. It's so beautiful there. But that is just so low lying. I mean, even on mm -hmm. days when 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 the tide is not even that high, it looks like the water's about to come over the wall, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I I have a friend in Shore Acres, and she has said she loves it there. But she said as soon as it, we get a big storm, like that's where the news media goes because of the flooding. It's always floods over there. Exactly. And I do wonder what that means for insurance policies and mortgages. Don't be surprised if one day mortgage companies are like, uh-uh, I'm not giving a mortgage on that house. Mm -hmm. You know, and that really creates big problems. Uh, so before even the water gets here, believe me, these mortgage companies, insurance companies are smart. Very smart people. We're actuaries with big degrees. You know that. Yeah. <laughs> so so they know before we know. And, and they will have that priced in and oftentimes just get out of the Florida market, which is what we're seeing. Okay, so that's 2050. Now let's look at 2080. Now mm -hmm. look at Davis Island. Mm -hmm. It's gone. Yeah. Davis Island is almost completely underwater there. Uh, some of downtown Tampa is underwater. Bayshore Boulevard, at least a block or two in, that's underwater. So parts of South Tampa. Um, you know, a lot of McDill Air Force Base you know, a lot more of Northeast St. Petersburg. And obviously, you know, it, it's a little harder to see here, but the Barrier Islands, they're, they're mm -hmm. suffering too. Pasa yeah. Grill, St. Pete Beach, all the way up to Madeira Beach, so forth. There's one area, and you probably, you've been here a long time, so you probably know Bel Air Bluffs and Clearwater. It's pretty high up. Mm -hmm. it, you go, it, so yeah. they don't have to worry as much about this. Uh, but, um, but what happens? Gentrification. So you, you probably heard this is happening in Miami. But uh, people uh, uh, that are close to the water, Miami's having major water issues. Mm -hmm. um, they've invested, you know, Miami Beach has invested over $500 million to raise the roads and install water pumps. And Miami, the city of Miami is doing the same. What's happening? Property inland is becoming more valuable. That property is, is where a, a lot of, uh, you know, native, a, a, lot of, a lot of Haitians have moved. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's a, a lot of uh, a lot of communities that just don't have money to relocate. They're there. Mm -hmm. People come in, they buy their properties, and now all of a sudden they have nowhere to live. And that is becoming a big issue there. So that's that's where I end at five feet of sea level rise. I don't think you want to see any anything beyond five feet. Uh, but um, but that all right. So the answer to your question then, because I probably didn't answer it yet, <laughs> we think probably realistically three feet by the late part of this century. Mm -hmm. Probably, maybe slightly less, maybe slightly more. Now, what we can't account for, start to get into a lot of these uncertainties when we get to the end of the century. Will we see some type of catastrophic collapse of Thwaites Glacier, let's say, down mm -hmm. in uh, Antarctica um, or something in Greenland? We don't know. Mm -hmm. If you ask most scientists, I think most would say, no, I think we're probably okay for the next 80 years, but that's the way, that, probably, yeah. cross our fingers. <laughs> But a catastrophic collapse could easily add one or two feet to that, you know, general general three feet. That's why I put the five feet up there because yeah. that is not out of the question. I, you, I've seen some some estimates say more than six feet is possible by 2100, and of course, at that point, it would be very difficult to live here, uh, yeah. you know, just because so many people will be forced out of their homes along the coastline and property values would soar away from the coastlines and. Anyway, I don't know what I don't know what's going to happen, <laughs> you know. But um, but it, it sounds dangerous. Yeah, and I I appreciated the the charts about kind of like what the Bay Area looks like. Um, but I was also thinking, I mean, we can imagine maybe a foot, and then on Bay Shore we have a seawall, you know, and um, we might just yeah get a little more of that nuisance water at high tide. But I was even thinking about like the beaches, right? Like a foot of water on a beach, right? You're gonna erosion and everything else, mm -hmm. you're not going to have a beach. And, right. you know, like many Floridians, I grew up also, right, spending summers on the beach. And so thinking about, you know, what will it look for my grandkids? 
um, you know, will they will they have the same beaches that we have? Right. You know. Yeah. yeah. No. I mean, it's it's definitely a question I, that there's no answer to, uh, but mm-hmm. it's something that you know we as a society have to try to plan to fix as soon as possible. Of course, you get a lot of people that say, well, you know, it's not just the U.S. and it's not just the U.S. It's a global. Mm-hmm. It's a big community uh, problem. Um, and when I say community, I mean the whole. The whole the whole world and uh, it's not easy to get people to agree on anything <laughs> let alone you know to fix this problem yeah. um but we are making progress you yeah, do you follow the progress of of climate solutions uh and kind of the progress of 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 are we seeing you know less you know carbon dioxide and less greenhouse gases uh you know uh, emitted uh, are we seeing the solutions to these problems make make progress um, maybe just a little bit. So I work at Eckerd College and they have a huge focus on sustainability. So we have a lot of both formal and kind of informal conversations and emails and things that go out about, you know, read this or, you know, yeah. often it's our faculty, right? Who wrote it? You know, so we wrote this or we did this. Um, so that helps me maybe stay in the know, like just a little bit. Um, but obviously I'm not an expert. So then uh, sometimes I'm, you know, reading these things or reading this study or I see something on the news. Um, but like I said before, sometimes it's also hard to determine, you know, what is fact or, sure. or fiction. So a yeah. lot of stuff floating out there and there's mm-hmm. a lot of, uh, climate deception mm. out there and it's, uh, not inadvertent. I mean, this is stuff that is, there's big money, uh, special interests that do not yeah. want changes, you know, their business model is working and they don't want it broken. And, uh, and so it's really hard for everyday people who don't have climate degrees or, you know, some type of, um, uh, background in 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 climate or or meteorology, uh, that you just sometimes you just don't know. There, it, yeah. it, it is very <laughs> tricky to weigh through that information, mm-hmm. uh, and it's a lot of it, and a lot gets thrown at you if it's something that you follow. So, mm-hmm. all right, the last thing you asked about was hurricanes. Yeah. <laughs> so, what do you want to know about hurricanes? Well, as I mentioned before, I was thinking about like what are those long term effects, but I think we also talked a little bit about that and about. Um, the like the premium the insurance premiums which i think is a effect that all of our bank accounts feel probably most immediately um but yeah like our i think hurricanes are obviously a concern for us as floridians so any like information that you might have on you know are they getting stronger or um i've always wondered about when we talk about like this will be a big storm season versus like small storm season so whatever kind of change we see it Mm -hmm. doesn't it's not like kind of like linear, you know, it's not linear. Yeah. No. And that is really confusing to people. Mm-hmm. Why, you know, why was it colder this year than last year? Yeah. It's not, it's not a straight line, mm-hmm. but the, the gradual trend line is always up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But not in terms of numbers of storms. That's something we don't, the jury is still out on whether we're going to see more hurricanes or less. Mm-hmm. The research has come back generally split. Although I'd say if there's been any kind of lean in this, it may be to keep the number of hurricanes about the same mm-hmm. or tropical systems about the same, possibly possibly even less. Mm-hmm. So that's a, a glimmer of hope. But the problem is, is what we do know is a greater proportion of whatever hurricanes that form, they will be stronger. Right. I have a graphic to show, JB, and uh, this is the reason why. Uh, on this graphic, where you see the red, that means ocean temperatures have gone up. And where mm. you see the blue, that means ocean temperatures have gone down. Mm. And it's very hard to find blue, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is. And in the tropics, you don't see any blue. Mm-hmm. Water temperatures in the Atlantic Ocean. In fact, I have uh, I have the tropical Atlantic where hurricanes form. See that mm-hmm. graph starting at about 1960, 70 or so, it starts mm-hmm. to go straight up. You know, yeah. not straight up, but it's a pretty, pretty uh, decent slope there. Yeah. And you can see that we've gone up almost a degree Celsius. So that's about a degree and a half, almost two degrees Fahrenheit in the tropical mm-hmm. Atlantic. Well, for every degree Fahrenheit of warming in the ocean, the potential for a storm to be stronger is about 15 miles an hour. So for mm-hmm. every degree, let's say our, 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 uh, the ocean temperatures underneath the storm have warmed two degrees since 1950. Mm-hmm. Well, that means the storm in 1950, let's say it was a 120 mile an hour storm, has the potential of becoming a 150 mile an hour storm mm. today. Now that may not seem like much, right? Because 120 sounds like a lot, 150 sounds like a lot. But the increase in, in, in damage because of the increase in force is exponential. So we see an exponential amount more damage. Now, I bring this up all the time, but I love to ask this question. I'm going to ask you. Okay. <laughs> um, let's say we had a storm with winds of 150 miles an hour mm-hmm. and compare it to a storm with winds of 75 miles an hour. So 150 mm-hmm. mile an hour storm compared to a storm of 75 miles an hour. Yeah. How much more damage does the 150 mile an hour storm do? 
I'm just just a ballpark. What do you think? Yeah, I was thinking more like four or five times the damage. Right. Yeah. So that's a really good guess <laughs> because it's not double. It's not yeah. causing du- right. If the winds are double, the, the the damage should be more than double. Right. We think right. Right. And it's not quadruple. So you're thinking at least quadruple, maybe slightly more. Yeah. Uh, how about if I were to say it's 250 times more damage? 250 yeah. times. So and increase those winds now from <laughs> 75 miles an hour to 180 miles an hour. Yeah. Now you're talking about about over a thousand times more damage because as winds get because our structures are built to withstand 75 mile an hour winds. So there's very little damage. Right. Our structures are now try, the new structures are built to withstand winds of 110, 115 miles an hour. So there shouldn't be that much damage. It would be superficial. But once those winds get past 130 miles an hour, now roofs are coming off. Now it's not yeah. just you know a couple thousand dollar repair. Now it's a uh, Thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollar repair. So that so the damage is is exponentially higher as mm. storms get turn. That's why just an increase of just an increase of thirty miles an hour in a hurricane uh, could be could be catastrophic in terms of the amount of damage. Mm. Hurricane Ian is now uh, the most costly hurricane in Florida history. It's not just because it was made stronger by climate change. It likely was because our waters are warmer now than, mm-hmm. than than they used to be. But it hit a populated area, a lot more infrastructure. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, the infrastructure is not 1980s infrastructure. It's 20, it's 2000, it's 2010, it's 2000. It's mm-hmm. it's infrastructure that is that's richer. It's it's cost more. Yeah. yeah. And and then even just your point about like, well, now we have a roof that's flown off. Well, then that roof is going to go hit something and yeah. create more damage. So even like the exponential nature of the winds, right? Like the more damage, then the more damage. Yeah. So yeah, that's really interesting. That's exactly right. Mm-hmm. And you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm old enough to remember um, when replacing a roof was twenty thousand dollars. <laughs> I'm not sure that you can find a contractor to replace your roof for twenty thousand anymore. <laughs> Point is, it, it hasn't just gone up with inflation; it's gone up right. like double. Yeah. So that so these insurance premiums are, are following suit. So again, uh, causes all kinds of problems. All right. So with all that said, I think we've covered all of the. Um, you know, all the topics that you kind of specifically wanted to talk about. Is there anything else that you want to talk about? And I'll ask the viewers at home, if you have any questions, just post them on our Facebook page and JB will bring those up. Uh, do you have a question already, JB? Okay, we have a comment. All right, let's bring the let's bring the comment up. Teach your kids to be responsible. It may make a tiny difference. <laughs> yeah, or maybe a big difference, right? So that's what I was mm-hmm. saying before. Um, plant a seed. Mm-hmm. Plant a seed because let's say your child rubs off on just two people. Then those two people will rub off on two people each. That's four people, right? So yeah. it's an exponential increase eventually. <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't you say? I would. I would. And I um I feel really privileged and blessed to be able to do a lot of this with my daughter. And we often are like, if I if she has a play date, I'll invite people over and they will the kids will come over and just pick fruits from the yeah. and veggies from the garden. And you know, we um, or they'll help out, you know, with our, we've planted some native plants, you know, so like they'll help out. Um, one of our favorites is making um, beauty berry jelly. So we get beauty berries and out of our yard and make the jelly. Um, but yeah, really like uh, sharing that right with her and then her friends and kind of that, that planting a seed, literal and metaphorical. Yeah. yeah um, I think that um, we've lost touch, my generation, especially mm-hmm. uh, lost touch with what sustains us? Mm-hmm. We don't know where our food comes from. Yeah. We we things just arrive. Things just arrive <laughs> at our door, and we're like, oh, yeah. it just mysteriously <laughs> arrived at our door. We don't yeah. understand what it takes, what we're taking from Earth to make the things that sustain us, and we, that means we don't appreciate it, right? We can just throw this in the garbage when we're done with it. Mm-hmm. Same thing with every the plastic that that is being made. We just we use it once, and we're like, ah, it's just you know. My wife refuses to return anything to stores. Yeah. Because she says that they, it doesn't go back on the shelves. It just goes into a landfill. Yeah. So she just donates it, hoping that, right? We, so we'll, we'll, we'd rather eat $50. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like we'd rather, you know, if we just, something comes and we just, for whatever reason, can't use it. We'd rather just, we'd rather just donate the, than get the money back. Because getting the money back means that it's going to be thrown in a landfill. Yeah. Because it's less cost for Amazon or whoever to just throw it in a landfill than to try to figure out what to do with it. So, yeah. um, that's it's so wasteful. So until we bring a generation up that, you know, that really understands and values the the resources it takes mm-hmm. to 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 sustain the lives that we have, then we're up Blanks Creek without a paddle. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, I, I agree. And like the the things that we try to do, uh, or I try to do with my daughter on sustainability are very similar. And 
I actually appreciate a lot of the like PBS Kids programming does help with these conversations. So my daughter will um, say something like, you know, there's there's trash, like we have to pick it up because it'll mm -hmm. it'll go harm the fish, you know. Mm -hmm. And so she is I very she's very that. tuned into like our our environment and trying mm -hmm. to be responsible for it. Yeah. My daughter's only 18 months old. We <laughs> we have we're still trying to get this morning she was laying on the ground throwing a tantrum, you know, that's just <laughs> several times I think and there's not yeah. much you can do about yeah. that. But the hope is that I can bring her up in a way where she has a real appreciation and she can help solve the problems that yeah, yours truly helped cause. I mean, mm -hmm. it's partially my fault. Yeah. <laughs> Let's be honest here. I just became I just got a real uh, big appreciation for all this stuff within the last 10, 15 years. Before that, you know, mm -hmm. I I didn't have it. Um, so, uh, it's, it's changing the, the thinking and, and the fabric, uh, of our society. And that takes at least a generation to do. It doesn't happen overnight. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, do you have any other questions for me? Things that you wanted to discuss, things that may be out in the climate sphere that are confusing to you that, you know, you're not sure what to believe. Mm, I don't think so. I think you actually answered all my questions okay. today. All Thank right. You. Good. <laughs> All right, Cameron Hunt McNabb, I want to thank you for being a part of our show. And uh, before we end, I just, uh, a couple things I want to uh, first tell you that you can visit our website. Visit WFLA.com and go to the Climate Classroom section, and you will find an article there. And we will, right after the show, we're going to take this, we're going to post it on the website so uh, you can watch it. Um, and I want you to tune in. It's every week or every other week. I'll be continuing to do these Climate Classrooms. Every week we'll have a, a different topic. We'll and we'll be discussing uh, your questions as well. And I want to leave you with uh, 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 some wisdom that I, I've gained over my years of doing this, which is that I always say this to people, and I want you to really think about this. Climate change is likely the biggest challenge that humanity has ever faced, but it's also our biggest opportunity. It's our biggest opportunity to change the way that we do things and do them in a better way and make a better society. And I really do believe that. And I believe that we can be optimistic about that if we can turn challenge into opportunity. And we're doing it right now. So again, thank you for joining me on Climate Classroom. And I'll see you again next week. Thanks, Cameron. Thank you. Watch or listen to Climate Classroom on these platforms and find Jeff's latest climate reports on WFLA.com.